All right, everybody, i um, going to go ahead and continue on with environmental emergencies. Go ahead and turn to page 728 in your book. Um, basically, these are the national EMS education standards as far as what we're talking about with uh, environmental emergencies. Um, I want you to make sure you review the chapter. Take a look at your chapter reviews and look at your questions. Also, look at your key terms, which are also in 728, and be familiar with those as well. I'm going to go over some of these topics um, as you can kind of follow along in your book. Like we said, starting on page 728, so if you want to go ahead and open your book and start to begin to follow along with the lecture, it'll probably make this a little bit easier and allow you to take notes as well. All right, during this lesson, you guys are going to be assessing and managing patients who have suffered from environmental emergencies, including exposure to heat and cold, as well as bites, stings, and some altitude sickness also. We're going to talk about how thermoregulation works, um, and we're going to give some examples through this about radiation, convection, conduction, evaporation. Uh, we need to know that the thermoreceptors send information to the hypothalamus. Okay. I and mean, think about some what medications or illnesses could interfere with this heat regulation. You've got to think also, why is hyperthermia more common when high humidity and low air movement accompany high ambient temperatures? So as we go through this lecture, that's a question you might want to keep in mind. You've got to think that it's exchanged through the environment via thermal gradient in which warmer temperatures move toward cooler temperatures. Okay, and the body responds to this by increasing or decreasing the amount of heat produced or lost from the body. Behavioral regulation, which is an input from the thermoreceptors, provides information to the brain regarding the patient's comfort level. So the patient makes a conscious effort to change the sensation and comfort level by taking some action. If too hot, the person might take off clothing, spray cool water onto themselves, maybe even fan themselves, or perform some other behavior to attempt to cool themselves off. However, if the patient is too cold, he might do the opposite. He might add clothing, stand next to a heat source of some kind, get out of the cold, okay, or wind, move about to increase their muscular activity to produce more heat, all right? And then we're talking about physiological regulation is basically an input from your thermoreceptors, which are located in the hypothalamus, which provides information to the brain, and the body responds with a physiological action to change the temperature disturbance without any conscious control by the patient. So in a cold environment, for example, the body constricts the peripheral vessels to preserve body heat and initiate shivering to involuntarily produce heat. In a hot environment, the body dilates the peripheral vessels to facilitate heat loss and initiate sweating to increase heat loss through evaporation. The body has to maintain an optimum body temperature so that cellular function can continue normally. If any time the body cannot compensate for the heat that is either gained or lost, the resulting cellular and organ damage can lead to an environmental emergency. Heat is always conserved through vasoconstriction. And it also has to do with your metabolic rate. Also, the higher your metabolic rate, the more heat you lose. Okay, so the body relies on three different body systems, the skin, the cardiovascular system, and the respiratory system to help maintain a normal temperature when the body becomes too warm. When heat gained exceeds heat loss, then hyperthermia results. When heat loss exceeds heat gain, hypothermia results. When the body loses more heat than it gains or produces, the result is hypothermia or low body temperature. Okay, some of the actions that we may take as an EMS provider may be help covering the patient up, removing them from the source, all right? Warm fluids, passive warming. Okay, heat loss occurs through five different types of mechanisms, and if you're following along in this book, you can see this chart in your chapter also. One of them is radiation, okay, which is body heat is lost to the atmosphere or nearby objects without physically touching them convection, which is body heat loss to surrounding air, which becomes warmer, rises, and is replaced with cooler air, conduction, which is body heat is lost to nearby objects through direct physical touch. So if the patient is placed on a 
scoop stretcher, the metal scoop stretcher will pull the heat out of the patient's body, causing them to become hypothermic. That is through the process of conduction. Okay, Evaporation, which is perspiration or wet skin, results in body heat lost when the liquid evaporates. And then respiration, heat loss through exhalation. Okay. Again, wind chill index chart, which you can also follow in your book, courtesy of the U.S. Army. Anything that speeds movement through the air, such as wind, also speeds the cooling process. That is where the concept of the wind chill comes into understanding and predicting hypothermia. So the faster the wind blows, the cooler the person's going to get. Which is why the elderly may get extremely cold because they get hot. They like to sit next to their air conditioner or sit next to a fan. And as the fan blows past their skin, they lose heat. The process in which a liquid changes to a vapor is called evaporation. Evaporation has a cooling effect. When body heat causes the body to perspire and the perspiration evaporates, the heat that has been absorbed by the sweat is dissipated into the air and the body surface is then cooled. When the amount of heat the body produces or gains exceeds the amount of body the, the amount the body loses, the result is hyperthermia, okay, or a high body temperature. So again, when the amount of the heat the body produces or gains exceeds how much the body loses, the body tends to overheat or become hyperthermic. All right. Got to think about thermoregulation. The body's all about balance. The body likes to keep its temperature at a specific rate and a specific range. So if the thermoregulation ability is lost when the body temperature reaches 95 degrees Fahrenheit, Coma occurs at 79 degrees Fahrenheit, which the mortality of this is high at 87%. It can be sudden onset, as when someone falls through ice into a frozen pond, or a gradual onset, okay, or from prolonged exposure to wind, cold air, or water. The thermocontrol, all right, which is the capability of the body to regulate its own temperature, is lost when the body temperature is lowered to 95 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Coma occurs when the body's core temperature reaches approximately 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Cases have been documented in which patients have survived after reaching a core temperature as low as 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit. However, death can occur within two hours of the first signs and symptoms of generalized hypothermia if not recognized and treated. Extremely low temperatures are not necessary for hypothermia to occur. It can occur in temperatures as high as 65 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the wind chill factor. People who are at the extremes of age, such as infants, especially newborns, and toddlers and the elderly are at the highest increased risk of hypothermia. People who have had recent surgery or who have had shock, head injuries, burns, generalized infection, spinal cord injuries, thyroid gland disorders, and diabetics, okay, are at very high risk for hypothermia. Some drugs, alcohol, and poisons can increase the risk of hypothermia also. The longer the time a person spends unprotected in a cold environment, the greater the chance that he will become hypothermic. Clothing that is inappropriate for the temperature enables a person to lose heat at a greater rate than if he had layers of clothing for cold environments. So dressing appropriately helps maintain your heat. Physical activity requires muscular movement that produces heat as a byproduct, which is called thermogenesis. Thus, a person who continues to move can generate internal heat that maintains the body's core temperature at a higher level than if he were not moving at all. The elderly have an impaired recognition of cold, the diminished basal metabolism, and poor constriction of blood vessels in the extremities. This can lead to a condition known as urban hypothermia, in which an elderly person becomes hypothermic in their own home. Hypothermia can occur with little warning and can progress rapidly from mild to moderate to severe to profound. Again, Table 24-1, if you're following along in your book, will help give you the ranges of temperatures for what we we're just talking about. As core body temperature drops, the body's thermal regulating mechanism and perception become confused. 
A person, even though dangerously cold, might undress thinking he is too warm. The initial reaction, okay, which is a piloerection or goosebumps. In hypothermia, these mechanisms are not enough to maintain body temperature. In water temperatures less than 77 degrees Fahrenheit, an immersed person who is not wearing protective gear can't generate enough heat from movement to maintain a normal body core temperature. In water, temperatures that are below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the person is at increased risk of dying from either drowning or severe hypothermia. A cold shock response is the first phase of response to cold water immersion. The immersed person exhibits respiratory pattern change with hyperventilation and gasp response. Loss of breath, which is holding ability, not, acclimat not acclimatized. Breathing becomes extremely erratic. Then it progresses into cold incapacitation. If the immersed person survives the initial cold shock response, he has approximately about 10 minutes before he becomes unable to perform any useful activity. He loses fine motor function first, followed by a loss of gross motor function, followed by the inability to perform any useful or meaningful activity. The reason for sudden death within 24 hours following rescue is related to, upon rewarming, the circulation of cold, acidotic, or alkalotic blood back into the core circulation. Another reason would be severe catecholamine release, which is epinephrine and norepinephrine. Another reason could be decreased hydrostatic pressure upon removal from the water, cold bear receptors that have a decreased sensitivity to blood pressure changes, increased blood viscosity, the blood becomes too thick as a result of the cold temperatures, and a decreased intravascular blood volume, decreased pump function of the heart also. Body temperatures can drop to the water temperature in as little as 10 minutes in some circumstances. In fact, body temperature drops 25 to 30 times faster in water than in air of the same temperature. Do not overlook the possibility of hypothermia in an elderly person who has been subject to the cool ambient temperatures of air-conditioned buildings. A patient in an air-conditioned environment who has decreased tissue insulation and an inability to move from a cold surface as a prime candidate for urban hypothermia, even on a warm day. Myxedemia coma is a complication that occurs late in the progression of hypo, I'm sorry, hypothyroidism and can be fatal. It occurs most commonly in the elderly women who present with extreme hypothermia which are usually roughly about core temperatures from 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Seizures, slow reflexes, and respiratory depression can follow. Although myxedemia coma occurs rarely in only about one-tenth percent of the hypo hypothyroidism patients, it is a true emergency, as death from its complication is most likely. Trench foot is common in military personnel. Trench foot results from exposure, of the feet to constant cold but not freezing temperature. Immersion foot is a result from prolonged immersion of the feet in cold or cold water or moisture. This can occur in the foot is kept in a cool or cold wet sock for a long period of time. The key in your emergency management of a non-freezing cold injury is to recognize the condition and prevent any further cooling or trauma to the extremity. Don't allow the patient to walk or stand on the affected foot or feet. Remove the footwear and socks carefully. Loosely cover the area with a dry, sterile dressing. Freezing cold injury, which is a local cold injury which occurs when ice crystals form between the cells of the skin. It tends to occur in the lower extremities and upper extremities, and as well as any appendages such as ears, nose, and your cheeks. Anything that's exposed to the cold. Cold injury requires much colder temperatures than are needed to produce generalized hypothermia. These are a list of some predisposing factors that can increase the likelihood of a person suffering a freezing cold injury. Freezing cold injuries that are localized fall into two basic categories, early or superficial injury and late or deep injury.
The injury can involve the whole hand or foot. Swelling and blisters filled with clear or straw-colored fluid can be present. Deep freezing cold injury is an extreme emergency and can result in permanent tissue loss or damage. Early or superficial freezing cold injury, which is known as frostbite, the patient is usually unaware of the injury which commonly develops after direct contact with the cold object, cold air, or cold water. Late or deep freezing cold injury exhibits itself as white and waxy in appearance. Palpation of the affected area reveals a firm to completely solid frozen feeling. The injury can involve the whole hand or foot. Swelling and blisters filled with clear or straw colored fluid can also be present with this injury also. Basically, scene size up. First off, ensure your own safety and look for clues based on the environment. Think about mechanisms of heat loss for this patient and do they have any predisposing factors. Things to look for may include some of the following. Is the patient protected from the cold environment? Is the ambient surrounding air cool or cold? Does the scene indicate the possibility of urban hypothermia, even though the nature of the call was something different? Is the wind blowing? Does it appear that the patient has been outside for a prolonged time? Are they in a remote area in which a long time might have elapsed before they were discovered? This might be particularly true with some snowmobile operators, skiers, hikers, hunters, and people who are involved in car crashes in remote areas. Carbon dioxide is the major stimulus to breathe in the normal patient. Thus, a decrease in carbon dioxide production decreases the drive to breathe, causing the respiratory rate and tidal volume to decrease and eventually become ineffective. So you have to be sure you're assessing the mental status and try to maintain an oxidation stat of 94% or higher. The pulse, the breathing, and the blood pressure are difficult to assess in a hypothermic patient due to the constriction of the vessels trying to preserve heat. You can rec you can you should exercise due diligence in confirming the presence or absence of vital signs prior to the application of CPR. The secondary assessment should be conducted in the back of a warmed ambulance. Do not delay moving the patient out of the cold environment to conduct the exam. If the patient is responsive, gather a history if possible. See if they have any predisposing factors that could increase the risk of hypothermia, such as exposure to a cold environment, their age, pre-existing medical condition, use of drugs, medications such as beta blockers or antipsychotics, alcohol or poisons. You have to be really cautious for hypothermia when treating a patient who is resuscitated outside. Sometimes rescuers lose track of time as they work on a patient in a snowbank or on an icy road. Some signs and symptoms of general hypothermia are going to include decreased mental status. It will correlate, however, with the degree of hypothermia. Amnesia, memory lapses and incoherence, mood changes, impaired judgment, reduced ability to communicate, dizziness, vague, slow, slurred, or thick speech, drowsiness, Okay, if you're still following along with the chart, okay, joint or muscle stiffness, lack of coordination, uncontrollable fits of shivering, okay, respiratory rates are going to change, change in pulses, rapid pulse at first, slow and barely palpable pulse for a late sign, irregular or absent pulse near the end of this hypothermic episode. Slowly responding pupils, typically dilated, and low to absent blood pressure. Signs and symptoms are generalized hypothermia typically occur in stages as the body core temperature fails. If you're following along, table 24-2 kind of gives you a slight exp explanation as to the different stages of hypothermia and how the body reacts. Make sure you remove any wet clothing. Dry the patient and use blankets to insulate the patient from the cold. Insulate the patient from the ground up. Get something underneath the patient as quickly as possible and remember to insulate the head. Protect the patient from exposure to the wind. Rough handling can cause cardiac dysrhythmia, especially ventricular fibrillation. Never allow the patient to walk or exert themselves in any way. 
Even minor physical activity can disrupt the rhythm of the heart. Administer oxygen to try to maintain a sat of 94% if possible. Use warm humidified oxygen. There is an increased evidence that the application of warm humidified oxygen can be extremely beneficial to the hypothermic patient during resuscitation. If ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia persist after the initial defibrillation, it might be reasonable to continue defibrillation as the patient is rewarmed. Follow your local protocols and continue CPR aggressively because prolonged survival in cases of hypothermia have been reported. Some experts advise active rewarming only if you are more than 15 minutes from the receiving facility. According to the American Heart Association 2015 guidelines, active rewarming should be applied to patients with a body core temperature less than 34 degrees Celsius or 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit or those in moderate or severe hypothermia. Active rewarming is a technique of aggressively applying heat to warm the body and include these measures, wrapping the patient in warm blankets, placing heat packs or hot water bottles in the groin, armpits, and in the chest, and turning up the heat in the patient compartment of the ambulance. Passive rewarming is taking measures to prevent further heat loss and giving the patient's body the optimum chance to rewarm itself. Passive rewarming includes inhibiting further heat loss by wrapping the patient in blankets and then increasing the heat in the ambulance. Do not allow the patient to consume stimulants, including tobacco, coffee, or alcohol. Never rub, I'm sorry, never rub or massage the patient's arms or legs. You could force cold venous blood into the heart, resulting in cardiac irritability or arrest. The safest rewarming takes place at the medical facility, so transport is the most important factor. Passive rewarming is taking measures to prevent further heat loss and giving the patient's body the optimum chance to rewarm itself. Okay, passive rewarming includes wrapping, like we said, in blankets, increasing the compartment, giving warm humidified oxygen, placing warm packs in the major vessel areas, such as the groin, armpits, next to the neck. Turbulence and activity in the water decrease survival time by approximately 75%. If the patient continues to move or struggle, they can cool more quickly because of the increase in the movement of cold water. Molecules next to the skin and around the body. Lift the patient from the water in a horizontal or supine position to prevent vascular collapse and provide supine motion restriction if spinal injury is suspected. Remove the wet clothing. Excessively I'm sorry, excessive activity can cause the heart to go into a V-fib rhythm, which is a fatal rhythm. So make sure you remove the clothing with as little effort as possible and try to keep the patient as still as you can. A freezing cold injury that is localized can be difficult to assess. While still frozen, even severely affected tissue can appear most normal with purplish or other abnormal colors appearing only when thawing. The tissue can be completely numb when frozen, but will be painful, burning, stinging, and throbbing before it freezes and then it thaws. Although you might be unable to assess its, its severity accurately, you can almost always see a clear demarcation at the site of local freezing cold injury. Never initiate thawing procedures if there is any danger of refreezing. Keeping the tissue frozen is less dangerous than submitting it to refreezing again.